Hey guys, it's Nathan. This is episode 28 of The Nathan Seawood Show. The Nathan Seawood Show. Personal conversations with powerful men. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Great to have you back uh, each and every week. I hope everything's going well for you. Got Norm Hewitt on the show this week, which I'm so excited about. When I first reached out to Norm uh, a couple of months ago, he replied straight back to me. We jumped on the phone, chatted for about an hour and a half, uh, and I was just so blown away by how, uh, how deep, how spiritual, how insightful Norm is, and you know, the journey has, he's been on to uh, really turn around his life and, and find himself and how incredible that's been. I was just really wonderfully surprised, and we just hit it off immediately and had a great chat. And it's taken a few months to get uh, to this point where we could record this episode together. But I'm so happy with uh, how it came out. It's a little bit of a longer one. It was just so fascinating listening to Norm talk about life and his story that I didn't want to interrupt it. So I let it go a little bit longer. And I think you'll get um, something out of the uh, the extra long episode. Uh, I'm in Tokyo this week. It's one week to go before I finish my career. So things are pretty hectic around here. Just uh, preparing, selling things from my apartment, getting ready to travel. Uh, signing on new clients into the business and yeah it's it's hectic I've had a couple of uh, panicky moments where it's felt all a little bit too much it's felt a little bit overwhelming but that's that's par for the course that's what's to be expected so um, I plan to make a video on Facebook next week just journaling this part of the journey of of giving up a career going into uh, entrepreneurship or business full time, and what that's entailed, and some of the the realities behind that, because it's not an easy journey, and uh, there's a lot of self doubt, you know, and at the same time, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of um, a lot of possibility that can come up in the future that's very exciting. Uh, so it's it's just a roller coaster. It's an emotional roller coaster. I'm very very well supported. I have incredible people uh, that are constantly checking in on me and helping me and talking me through different things, which. Uh, the community aspect has been so valuable to this transition. So, uh, yeah, look out for that video next week. It'll be my last day. I'll have uh, a week or so uh, still here in Tokyo before I leave. And my first stop will be Medellin in Colombia, where I'll be spending a month with a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, exploring that city, working on our businesses. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of fun stories that will come out of that. So look forward to that. Uh, so back to Norm, uh, as always, the first thing I asked Norm was to tell me a little bit about his upbringing. Norm grew up on a farm uh, in the North Island of New Zealand and had a bunch of brothers and sisters and had a pretty uh, pretty tough upbringing on the farm, as you'll hear. And so uh, I asked Norm to really uh, take his time and taking us through the detailed version of his life story. So here it is, conversation I've been looking forward to for a couple of months. So enjoy this personal conversation with the powerful Norm Hewitt. Yeah, I grew up in a um, small farming community in Central Hooks Bay called Mangled Upper Station. Uh, closest village was about eight k's away uh, called Prongahoe, Prongahoe Village. Uh, there was a real big difference of, you know, we lived in this valley and there was a scrap of farm and uh, we had a school that had 21 kids, the seven brothers and sisters. We were the, one of the biggest families, we were fine over there. And you know, mum's Māori, dad is English, Irish, uh, we're Pākehā. And so we were one of the only mixed families on the station. Um, growing up was, you know, it was just one big, amazing adventure. You just had all the space, there was, you know, horse, Tommy, a horse here, it was there a family pet that was just an amazing part of our family. Um, Trixie, our dog, uh, Fluffy, our cat. Uh, we had plenty of animals. Dad was the cowman gardener because it was a station that had very lush and lawns and the gardens were just amazing. And uh, he was the cowman gardener. So he milked cows. I learned the trade really young, um, getting up early in the morning. Really enjoyed the first part. I know going to school was hard because you're breaking away from those apron strings, you know. But um, it, I think the journey that I know there was there was early years where I just saw this as an adventure, and it started changing. I think it was around five. My first day of school, I never went to because I had a hangover. 
all the guys and decided that the uh, at the outset that on my fifth birthday they put a honey down and there was this happy party at our place, but really it was a it was an excuse for the adults to go and get pissed and drink and for the kids to kind of get involved. And my job my job was to uh, go flick the tops of the courts of the bottles of beer and drink a little bit of froth that used to come off the top of the court and pour the beer and then the froth on top of the glass. So it didn't take long and I think it was a bit of a standard um, that the community set out to, uh, to do to watch young kids drunk and use that as a bit of a laughing place. But uh, my mum said my first day of school I never went because I had a hangover. Uh, so I can, I can, you know, look back over in life and, and go, well, this is where my, this is where my journey of, of alcohol began. It was in an environment where the men worked really hard, families worked really hard on the farm, but they also partied really hard. And because we had a mixed family, and Dad was one of the older statesmen on the farm, the boss of the farm said to him, look, you take care of all the young guys, and one of the things taken care of the young guys was to party all the weekend. He didn't, they didn't want them driving down to the local pub. So they used to have parties at our place. And from then I started realising you know, the, the world was a wee bit different uh, because, you know, mum and dad during the week were fine. They come to the weekend, they were real, you know, they were always, uh, they held a junior rock and roll title like in, in Hastings and yet when drunk or when drinking uh, was involved in that, there was always, a, you could see this sense that it was, you know, we started off really well, then everyone was happy, then there was this party going on, and then Dad would get really drunk, and then there'd be an incident. There was always an incident at a certain time of the night. You kind of knew when that was happening, or when that was going to happen, so you kind of you took yourself away from it. But when it happened, sometimes it was really, really ugly. That's when I realised that the world was, oh, okay, there wasn't this great big adventure anymore. It was about making sure that you were keeping yourself safe. Um, and I, I could tell, and I started becoming very aware of, of adults and which ones were safe around me and which ones weren't safe. Um, and I could tell by the way, you know, I knew by the way my dad closed the car door when he came home from the pub if there was in a good mood or a bad mood. He slammed the door and he was swearing and cursing. I, I knew it wasn't safe, so I'd jump out my bedroom window and jump on the horse Tommy, and then I'd listen to the violence that was going on in the background. I thought that was normal, but I would never saw this with any other families. But I just thought it was normal. I thought this must be what every family goes through and experiences. So is it only um, looking back and you know now that you can see, oh, that was when the change occurred? Yeah, I just I just know that um, you know there are there must be an amazing pressures on on mum and dad at that point in time having seven kids. I mean. To actually just earn your basic living, but there was also this real underlying jealousy and anger that Dad had in his in his in his veins, because I could see the violation of animals when Dad was hung over and the cows would do as they're told and you know get up and get into the place they needed to be and he just he'd attack them. Um, so, you know, I could, I, I went back, you know, when you look back on, on life and you go, what was that about? Where did that come from? And so that was, you know, that was a real, that was a real starting point in regards to what I thought was normal. And then as I came into adolescence and then went to boarding school, it, it was a normal place to escape was through drugs and alcohol, mm. to escape the realism of, you know, what was still happening at home? Was it still happening? My brother, little brother and sisters were still there. Who was looking after them? You know, um, I remember, you know, it, you know, from at seven, I decided I was going to be an all black. It was 1976, seven or eight. Um, because, you know, part of the, 
the whole community was when there was a test match on, everyone came down to watch a test match. There was always beer involved and the old cold fish and chips in the, in the oven tray into the oven, the old, you know, uh, chipatties, you know, the old chip, hot chip sandwiches, real white soft bread with lots of butter and all what is tomato sauce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That kind of sense of it. But I remember watching this game and I said, I'm going to be in order. Didn't know how, but that became a, a wee bit, that became like a, a a way to escape and just get really focused on something and hold, hold on to something. But every time there was a violation in the home, whether it was myself getting a hiding or my brothers and sisters getting a hiding or my mum getting a hiding, I built up this real anger inside me. So as a young boy, I didn't have this. My the teachers used to say I had this very, you know, polite manners and my, my nanny, my grandmother would always say, please and thank you, would take you around the world. So I understood that for quite a while, but I started building this real resentment and real anger inside me because I had no control to stop my father. And every time there was a violation, I would just layer on top of another layer of anger. And where, I just, did you, where did you fit in terms of your siblings? Were you eldest, youngest? So middle child. Middle child. I've got two old Two older sisters, older brother, me, uh, two younger sisters, and then um, a younger brother. So being in that middle, I suppose, I, I didn't you know. They say the middle child has, has certain things, but I don't know. I just go, you have to feed for yourself because you're not the first child and you're not the last child, and the first child gets everything and the last child gets everything, and everyone in, the, in between has to fight for everything. But I, you know, you know, we had a very structured house. We, everyone had chores. Um, we, from feeding the chooks to feeding the job to doing the vacuuming, making all the beds, um, to, you know, taking, killing animals in regards to chickens and helping mum, you know, pluck them and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there was real structure within the house. But I think there was this also this underlying fear. Uh, I remember my dad's father coming, and that's who I'm named after, Norman, coming to live with us. And he was, uh, I don't think he was a functioning alcoholic, but he was definitely uh, an alcoholic because he would drink a flask of Gordon's gin every night. Um, and I think that was my dad trying to reconnect with his father and, and talking to my dad since then, that, that was the reason. But, uh, my mum said to dad, you need to get your father up and start building a relationship with your father. As I've now subsequently found out that my dad was had gone through that same journey that I was going through as a boy. He went through, he was, I'm nine years old when I, my dad comes home and, and beats me to the point where I feel like I'm going to die. There's bruises across all my body and I go to school and, you know, everyone walks away from me. Um, it was a really interesting time. That in that moment, there was this absolute isolation and then the real darkness of, of that journey really went into a place where, you know, um, I remember sitting on the, on the loo and I'm trying to cut my wrist and my mum comes in, I'm 11, and mum goes, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, everything, the world's against me right now. I don't fit anywhere. I'm the worst kid in the world. The teachers stick me in the corner and I'm fighting with the teachers and I'm getting, coming home and I'm, I see this violations at home. I, I'm trying to express myself and I'm just starting my journey as a young man. All these emotions are going around and I'm just putting them all in there because my father never talked to me you know, he showed me a lot of great things. But the conversations I wanted to have was, was was more than that. I wanted my dad to tell me what it was like growing up when he was a boy and what he used to do and what was his great joys. And, you know, it seemed like there was none of that conversation going on. I never remember when I was a boy that my father ever told me he loved me. And as I got older, that's something I really yearned for. And when I had the opportunity for that to happen, I wish I had that when I was a boy, because it took took me right back to that moment. 
How do you feel about that moment that, that you know, when you're trying to cut your wrist, like, how do you feel about that now? You've done a lot of, you've talked about it a lot, you've been very open about it. Is it, do you still feel the emotion around it? No, I don't because there's, there's a part now where I am free from all that space. The violation that happened when I was nine was a critical moment in my life where my father imprisoned me inside myself. Where everything, uh, all the turmoil got stuck right deep down in my soul, in my pitfall. And that, that enabled me to, one, protect part of myself, and it disabled me because it was a place I would always go back to. So I don't have any of those same emotional um, anchors or fears that I can, I can, I'm very open about talking about it, but I don't go back to revisit that space and re, you know, know what it actually feels like. There's been times since the documentary Making Good News, since we made the documentary that I'm watching that and I'm looking at my father and I think of his frailty now as a man and yet he was a big man when I was a boy. I think all fathers were when they were a little boy, they were heroes in some respect. Uh, and yes, my father was a hero. He was the man I really wanted to be in a lot of ways because he had, his, he had a really amazing work ethic. He worked really hard and he, he taught me about how to do various things to drive, to, to calf a cow and to, to milk cows where I would, you know, I think I'm 10 or 11 and I'm milking cows and my dad's allowed me to do the whole job, you know, and, and I drive the old Land Rover up to the cow shed and, and I feel like I'm a man. But I was socially awkward, you know, because I didn't know how to, I, I, I showed it on, on various ways with my behaviour. I was quite impressionable and socially awkward, and, and inside I was scared. Were you quite a were you quite a sensitive kid? Um, yeah, oh, I absolutely. Didn't. I suppose it was like it was like a lot of boys growing up in those times. Is that we were never allowed to show any emotion, and any emotion that was shown, we were always told to harden up, stop being a girl, stop crying, your pussy, you know, all that stuff, and you just suppress it. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face is as a male society is crying is not a, doesn't mean you're soft. You know, showing that emotion that you can. Uh, my son Alexander, I, I love to hug and kiss him. He's just starting to kind of move away from it, particularly in his friends, and I don't want to embarrass him. So I've got to be really mindful of that because this is his dream, but I want him to know that I will always be there. And I get it wrong, you know. I, I get fatherhood wrong. What I've also realised is that there's no such thing as perfection. There is purpose. It's so hard too because it's you often, you know, what I see, I was just talking about with some friends last night, it's you, you want to do the opposite of how you were treated. You know, like the wrongs that you had, it's like, well, I didn't, I, my dad didn't yeah, say yeah. I love you, so I'm going to say I love you to my son 50 times, whether or not that's the right thing or not. It's just like that's what you feel you want to do. That's right, that's right. And always give them more than what you didn't have, you know, all those kind of So there's, there's, no, there's no real perfect way. It's just gathering the tools along the way, sharing those. And I think that's been one of the great things now as a, as a father of you to go start sharing these conversations and tools while we're having this conversation. Because it's come from a place of pain, anguish, and hurt, despair, loneliness. There's been no courage in that space until you get to a moment where your mother finds you sitting on the blue to try and express your feelings, but you're pleading, I'm pleading with my mum not to tell my dad. Please don't tell dad because I, didn't, I don't want to anger my father. Or, or actually be seen as a real weakness within that event. And I think from that moment, I always tried to prove myself to my father. But, you know, I'm 16 and I'm, I'm at a boarding school. Stuff has gone on when I was 13. My first sexual experience was, was by, at the hand of another boy and I'm really confused. I, I really start turning to drinking, violence, anger, because it's all that's now is coming out. I'm right in the middle of adolescence and I'm more confused than ever. I try and 
prove myself physically if I if I have a girlfriend and I'm trying to prove myself physically in a relationship. I'm a man, so I can do this, you know. Yet there was this absolute adolescent world which is just, you know, the violation at nine, the violation at 13. 13 was another pivotal moment where, again, everything that wanted to come forward got pushed down into a deeper space. Never want to revisit that space, never want to go there. So my my nature and my, my being starts becoming promiscuous in the whole kind of evolution of my sexual will. I find that really challenging and difficult. But how do I go and tell my mum and dad? This is all going on. So one night, I'm 16 years old, I'm at home, we're having a big party, and dad goes into one of his rages, and I, and I smash him. It was something that I'd been waiting for all my life since I was a boy when that first happened. I think this is the moment I really lay and I just, I, I only hit him once. But I felt this, you know, I thought, okay, this is it. It's going to get rid of all that anger and all that tension. But it didn't. Actually, I felt, felt worse. I felt, it's my day. And then he calls the police and he tells me he doesn't want to do anything to do with me. And from 16 right up to 18, 19, I had this battle. It was a dark battle of violence. Because what did it look like from his perspective? He he could see his own his own anger coming out. He just saw you come out and hit him one day out of the blue. Yeah, and I mean, like, man, I just I remember the intensity of that moment. So, you know, it fractures the evidence. The violation, you know. Violence begets violence, but it never solves anything. It breaks and fractures families, and no one gets to know there's no winners out there. And that continued you know, the violation, they get drunk, they get angry, they get violent. It was the same journey my father was doing, and I was just following that same journey. I think in the end, part of that, that violence allowed me to play rugby because. I was a very aggressive player and I didn't I didn't care even if we won or lost. As long as I hit somebody, that was my goal. That was my true goal down in my soul. Everything else I told all the coaches, you know, I did it the way they wanted me to do it, but my real goal was to hit people. I wanted to inflict pain on people because I had all this anger inside me. Um, the drugs wasn't doing anything for me. I was smoking dope at GIT College constantly, six or seven times a day. I was selling and drinking and doing all these things. I don't know how they that I stayed at school so long because that was a big part of my world. I still had this, this sense that rugby was part of my saviour. And I still wanted to be a rugby player, and I wanted to be an author. And then uh, you know, part of this journey at Teoti was Gavin Hines. Gavin Hines was a senior boy who, who saved my life, basically. Taught me how to fight. My initiation at the end of his teaching me was to stab him with the pair of scissors. And I, I remember that. I remember him coming in and saying, hey, you're going to be OK now. Don't be a pair of scissors. I'm going to stab him. I put on his forearm. I think I stared at him for, it felt like an age that I stared at Gavin straight in the eyes and then put the scissors up and stabbed him. Like, without him flinching. And from that point on, I was, uh, I felt I was in total control of everything I was doing. But it was based on fear. Absolute fear. And then I had a sense of why is it okay for a big guy to pick on a little guy? So I started bullying the bullies at school. I was literally running the school based on fear. If any little guy got picked on, I'd go and deal with the big guy. i put gloves on him and I'd say, okay, you can... It's okay for you as a big guy. Why don't you pick somebody your own size? So... You little guys don't hit you back, but this guy can. And I never lost. 
but it was all based on fear. So there's no connection, no no connection to anything emotional. It's just fear hurt people. Stay in charge. Stay in charge. Hurt people. Pretend. Behind this mask was this nine-year-old boy trapped in this prison. And yet, there's a 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 23, 26, 28, 30, 42, 44, 45-year-old. As that 45-year-old to go next, this nine-year-old boy stays here. And that's the person who's trapped. And I was trying to find a way to free that person. And I thought through, through my premise of fear, through my premise of violence, through my premise of drugs and alcohol, that I could free that. All my, my physical attributes to my relationships, because my most, most of all my relationships was about the physical dominance, not so much the love. There was the word of love, but there wasn't this real being of love. I had to protect that person. That was that nine-year-old trapped and everything else. And I likened it to a wall. I, I built this wall that was so thick that everything outside it had no emotion attached to it. Everything inside it was the emotion that I had been bashed into and protected. So you didn't have any experience of sadness or any any of those kind oh, of emotions? Yeah, there was sadness. Absolutely. There was there was sadness, but it was in check. And that was in check. It was like, yeah, yeah, I'm sad, I'm really sad, but I would not show that sadness. Why would I show sadness? That's a weakness, because I always got told to harden up when you showed the sadness. It was a really interesting time. I think from that nine-year-old boy to the 45-year-old man. And yet, 1999 was the beginning of the change. So, you know, I became an all, I went, I got kicked out of school. And I got caught with some drugs and I was a prefect. So I had this leadership role. I had great relationships with various people that I could manipulate. You know, manipulation was a big part of it. And then there were, you know, Pete Graham at school was, a, was the, he worked on the farm. He was the first of the, with his wife, Lyndon Graham. He actually started to show me that, you know, you could focus that, that anger into another place. So he was a boxer. Um, but I still, I worked really hard, I trained really hard, but I still had this tendency to go, yeah, but I'm still in control. Really, I was totally out of control. What was the out of control like? What was that experience? How did that look? Uh, the, 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 the description that comes to mind is like, you know, it's the duck on the water, everything was moon sailing on top, but it was chaos underneath and trying to keep control of it was as much as showing everyone else it was all calm. I had control over certain aspects, but there were certain lines that I would try and control, but I, I couldn't control everything. Was it like in relationships and stuff like that, trying to control other people? Or... Yeah, and, and um, you know, I got always got to a certain point in every relationship, whether it was a relationship with um, a girlfriend or a relationship with a friend, where I self-sabotaged and I broke the mirror. And that came through very clearly later on looking back because I always, everyone in my life, and particularly adults, broke that trust somewhere in my life. So I stopped trusting adults. And then I stopped trusting people. And so the easiest way to stop trusting people is to self to sabotage it somewhere along the line. And it was always when I felt it was getting comfortable or what was going too good. You know, this relationship's going really too, too well. You no, know, it's got to have some chaos in it because I understand chaos. I'm better in control. I think I'm more in control when I'm in chaos. So I would destroy those relationships, every single one of them. At a certain point in time, I 
you know, subconsciously or consciously, I was destroying these relationships because everything was too good to be true because every time it was too good to be true, it got broken. So it was better to break it before someone else break it. You know? Yeah. And, and I think that was the real challenge. That was the real challenge. And because I'm sure there's still a craving for that connection. Oh, there was always that craving. Well, every time I got it, and when I was young, it was hurt. And if that nine-year-old still in prison did me, I'd go back to that nine-year-old. Up till then, there was, you know, there was that adventure, and then there was this, no, oh, it's not quite like that, and then there was this reality check. So from that point right through nine years old and onwards, I was already in prison, so what was the best way to protect myself in prison? Was to now never let anyone come and visit that person. Yeah. Because that was the vulnerable person. That was the the scared person. That was the person who had formed relationships and trust in those relationships, and every single one of them was broken. Whether it was uh, with my best friend, or whether it was a teacher that I trusted, or whether what I wanted to change, but no one really kind of guided us. And if they did, I would I'd break it anyway. Uh, it was like going over to take take a, a mate's favourite toys. That continued for such a long time, even when I was in Albright. So, you know, I, I, I left school and I worked in the freezing works and the, and the cold stores in Hawke's Bay because I was a rugby player. So I, I became what everyone wanted me to be. And then, you know, ultimately, I kind of described myself as I just became an arsehole. I became a deputy. I think there were parts of me that people liked and there were other parts that they didn't like. And, you know, I liked both those people because it made me feel in control. So what was your path into becoming an All Black? Do you remember the day you got the call? Yeah, 1993. Um, actually, it was 93. So I left school in, in six. In 87, I was playing for Hawks Bay Colts. In 88, 87 is the first World Cup in New Zealand. I'm playing for Mac, Mac and Tech Old Boys, and I'm, you know, there are no schoolmasters, no one tells you when to get up, and there's no classes, and I'm like, friend this world, I'm making a bit of money. Someone's giving me a job because I'm a good rugby player. Someone's taking me in their house, and I'm sleeping on their floor, and oh, it's time to be a man, and freedom, like making your own money and playing. Um, there were really good people around me, and again. So, and that, is that childhood dream of being an All Black, is that still very much alive in you oh, all this time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a point, there was a point when I was, when I was sexually abused at 13, where just about all those dreams had gone. And I liken it to a candle. When you light a candle and the light and the flame, Starts off really low, then it burns really high. And then when you blow the candle out, there's that little red ember. And as it goes out, there's this wisp of smoke that goes out. Someone was like come down and just just took it down to the ember and it was just going out and then somebody gave it come along and but it blew it and then the flame came back and it was a little flame, but it was enough. And there was enough flame that kept holding on to that to say, I, I can do this, I want to do this. I had a goal and it, it became a wee bit of, I, I really want it, but I still want to behave like this. So is that guys mm -hmm. like Peter Graham came along and, and helped just kind so of... Gavin Hines, Peter Graham, um, the Maple Tech Old Boys Rugby Club. Um, there were great men in there that I really looked up to. Terence Taylor was one of the, became my idol. Um, you like a big brother, you know, and then I said, I have all these big brothers I had to live up to, so I had to drink the same as them and behave the same as them. I just kind of like went, yeah, that's the way I want to be. Um, but really deep down, I was just urging for this belonging. I can't show this nine-year-old out there. I, I, you know, I didn't want to free him anymore because I was so busy trying to be this rugby player. And that was the environment. That was the culture. 
I remember I was playing with players like Mark Shaw, Cowboy Shaw, and Cowboy Shaw was a legend when I was at school. Baron Higginson was a legend when I was at school. I played with some very, very amazing players in my early years. But I was the kind of like the young fellow who, you know, the hooker that was crazy. It was like I had this psycho kind of ability to go nuts. And that, you know, crazy norm. You want crazy? I'll give you crazy. Play up to that space. So there was always, you know, rugby was always a constant through here. It was never a problem with having a job because rugby was allowing me to, for people to give me a job. But I continued to let people down. You know, I played Hawks Bay. Um, I became captain of Hawks Bay, Graham Taylor. Uh, I had a mentor there. His name was Joe Foe. He was the YMCA powerlifter. And he taught me how to get strong and really big. So my physical size grew immensely. You know, I, my strength was was right up there. I could deadlift and squat and bench press. And, you know, there was this kind of like, yes, I was, I was starting to become somebody. Um, and I was kept in the hook. So you actually had, you, you had like a lot of really amazing role models around there. You had a lot of mentors and support. Um, I did. Yeah, for that, that part them, of your life. I, I did, but I kept them here. You know, I, I kept them outside that wall. Yeah. As much as I brought them in, they weren't, they, they weren't ever in as close as that, you know. Because I just didn't didn't know how to let people into that space. And again, all my relationships were based on a physical conquering, not, not an emotional connection. Well, like you said, you lose the trust like anybody you'd ever let in and hurt you in some way. So that's right. why would you do that? That's right. And that's the, the more I see that within many of the people that I'm, I'm now having conversations with. There's always this first point of trauma somewhere in your life. And it's to go back to that first point of trauma and understand that, that being trapped in that place, in that prison, is the first place to set yourself free from. And to go back there and tell yourself it wasn't your fault that you were made to feel like that. It wasn't your fault that actually happened to you. You did nothing to deserve to be treated that way. And that's what I've come to know. And going back and just sharing with people, going, wow, this is where it comes from. But it actually goes back generations to the violations of war. When men went to war and they never came back, and if they came back, they came back with this, um, this weight of trauma that then traumatised their families and generations beyond. And that's part of the, the going back in the history and, and seeing that, understanding it, listening to the stories of the old men and women who talk about the wars, the age of the wars that were the years. So I'm in Hawke's Bay, I'm playing my, you know, through rugby in 1993, the Hawke's, the uh, Orange, Irish and British Lions um, are touring and they have a game against Hawke's Bay and I'm captain. And that day was a turning point in my rugby career where we beat the British Lions. We beat the Lions for the first time in the history of Hawke's Bay. Wow, must have been, it must have been huge. It was amazing. It was like, you know, you were right on top of the world. And that was the difference. Between, I'd been to All Black Trials before then. I'd been in Māori teams. I'd been in New Zealand Colts teams. But this was the one the week before the All Blacks got beaten in Wellington. We beat them midweek. I get invited up to Auckland for the third test in if they'd lost them, then that would have been my chance to take over from Sean Fitzpatrick. End of year tour, I get named, so I'm, I'm at home. They used to do it live. You never got a phone call from the coach and saying, hey, you're in the All Blacks. It was, you had to watch it live on TV. All my family around, there's kind of a sense that, yes, I could potentially be going on tour. And I remember, um, you know, they're calling the names at Norm Hewitt Corpus Bay. I didn't jump up and down with joy. I just kind of looked out and I went, yeah, I always knew I was going to be an all-black. It made sense. It made sense. And how I got there. And there were moments through that, that time. I mean, Laurie Maines was coach. And then 92, I got myself into trouble in Hawke's Bay. And he wrote to me and he said, oh, I think I've 
I wrote to Laurie and I said, Laurie, you know, I really stuffed up. What do I have to do? And he wrote back and says, you've got to get yourself off the booze that's, that's destroying you. So I went on off the booze, you know, I went drive. I thought, yep, yeah, no, I can do this. I was focused because that's part of my personality. I'm an excessive compulsive. You know, you give me a challenge, I'll, I'll put 110% into it, but I'll, I'll actually push everything aside. Either full on or full off. That's right. It's all or nothing. It's always been that way. And so, you know, I, I make the tour, play for the All Blacks. You know, keep playing for the All Blacks. There's a change in coaches. There's a change in culture. Still want to be an All Black. And then I just, I didn't like who I'd become. Because, it, you know, playing rugby gave me power. And more power on top of the power or about all we had. And if you're an all black in New Zealand, like for those people that don't live in New Zealand, that you've reached the peak of being absolutely. a Kiwi. That's right. And so I think, well, I've become this arrogant human being. On top of this arsehole, <laughs> I now was arrogant. And I treated people that way. Was this you know, I, I thought I was being a good human being, but there was always this contradiction inside me, this contradiction of what I really wanted to be and the person I was in front of me. And it was all consuming. It must have been an interesting feeling to be, you know, an all black, to be at the top of the world, like to get your childhood dream, but still feel something missing. Oh, it, it was, it was empty. It fulfilled a, a, a small part, but what I found was that it was it was soulless. I was soulless. There was no real purpose. It was it was something I did, and it was something that fulfilled a, a physical part of me. But I was spiritually poor, and that emptiness was that boy trapped in prison. That boy was still trapped and had never grown up. And yet, physically, as a man, I'd grown up. But spiritually, I was still a boy. Psychologically, I still went back to the boy. In any moments where it got hard, I'd find an excuse to behave in a certain way, and then I'd apologize. It was the boy who was crying wolf all the time, but no one ever said to me, What's really going on? What's really going on? I would have deers. People would say, I'll oh, go jump off there. And I'd say, I'll make sure I know. I'll go and jump off the highway. Don't run in front of that truck. I know, I'll just stay and stand and watch it jackknife and then run away. It was these kind of moments that it was just playing with that, that life and death scenario all the time. And, uh, you know, that continued right through to 99, and 99 was a, a, a real the, the turning point. It, there were moments where I felt I had everything under control. There were moments where I felt, I'm through this. There were moments where I felt, no, life is really good. I, I told myself that, but I knew I was, it wasn't true. I wasn't even living, I was just existing. And to just exist without purpose is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces. You've got to have a purpose. And 1999 was the beginning of, of that journey to find that purpose. You know, I've been to a World Cup in 1995, in South Africa, um, I've been, I've met some amazing human beings in, in the world, but it was like, I was in this world here, from a physical point of view, but I was trapped in this world here, from an emotional and spiritual point of view. And 1999 was the beginning of the awakening. So what was what, what was the moment like? What when leading up to the moment that it was you knew it was time to change? Oh look, I I just I just ended a, a long term relationship. Well, I didn't end it. 
achieved with it. Um, and I was alone. Rugby turned professional. And, you know, I was like a functioning alcoholic. I could not drink for five days, but I would drink for two days. And I thought, no, that's okay. If I don't drink for five, I can drink for two. But when I was drinking those Saturdays and the Sundays after the game, it was excessive. It was the same pattern that your parents had when you were a kid. Correct. That's right. So patterns follow us. Hmm. We, we, it's like we're on this continuum here and we need a paradigm shift and that paradigm shift is to break that pattern. And then something else in evolution changes. And I was right in that pattern. I had, you know, no, I was earning hundreds of thousands of dollars. I had a very big house. I had everything I, you know, wanted, you know, sometimes look at it going, how did I get this? And there was something there that was always looking after me, whatever that was. There was a bigger purpose, but I had to, I had to go and discover that purpose, that right, I suppose that right, right of passage into that room. And so leading up to that, there was a, you know, there was a trauma of, of injury as the All Blacks. There was a, a breakdown in the relationship. Um, there was alcohol and, you know, it just spiralled out of control. 99, the All Blacks were getting ready for a World Cup campaign and I was in the World Cup squad. I'm coming back from an injury, I knew it wasn't right. You know, I, I don't get selected. I come back to a Hurricanes campaign down in Queenstown and I go get shit faced. I go smash myself up, end up in an ambulance, driving all the way to Indicado to have an operation to fix my own artery, to take the glass out of my guts and my back, and my arms. And there was to get back to Queenstown. To apologise to the team, I think that was the first time I realised it was a moment because I remember apologising to the team, and I'd done that many times. This became this incident is in the news and everything. This becomes like sort of a famous moment oh, this for is you. A, absolutely, the infamous, infamous, I should the say, yeah, moment of where I get back to Queenstown. Because the game is professional, I'm potentially going on a World Cup tour. This is the lead story. Lead story, six o'clock news. Lead story, Paul Holmes, when he was there. Late Paul Holmes. This, when I got back to Queenstown and apologised to the team for my action, only half the team came up and shook my hand. That's when I realised I was full of shit. That's when I realised. People didn't I've believe you. This. They didn't believe me. This was the true moment the boy cried wolf for the last time. I remember an overwhelming feeling of anxiety. Um, I had just met a new potential partner. I mean, I'd heard it. we'd been out for a coffee. Maybe had a dinner together. And it was all unraveling. Like it was like a death of cats. It was just falling. And Queenstown was that the first car that came out. And then from there, with the team, and then it was the media. Was then what do you do? How do you front? You know, you dress up and put a tie on, you try to cover the scars. And I remember, you know, all, all through my rugby career, you know, there, you absolutely, there, were, there were really good people who, who wanted to support me. One of them was Michael Lewis, CMP, he was an MP, Orcs Bay, the National Party. When I first got myself into trouble, he helped me. And he was somebody like, was totally opposite, polar opposite to me. He was a skinny white boy. 
politician, another Māori boy, rugby player. Hau, yeah, chalk and cheese. What was his motivation to help you? He saw something in you. He did. And I think that's was a lot of people saw something. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't see it myself. And I think that's part of the challenge is that when people, when people reach out and they say, look, you have all this potential and, you know, I see something in you, but you can't see it because you're that person still trapped in prison. There's nothing, you know, you, you hate the way you look. You look in the mirror and you hate that person looking back. That's all you have. How can you, how can they see something different than you? So 99, that moment was a, a, a critical moment. It was a kind of a series of events that starts to unfold. Unfold, and it unfolds really quick. Yeah. Real quick. There's uh, media on the doorstep. There's media following me in the road. There's, you've got to get down and here's, here's your, this is what we want you to say. And that's the big thing. This is what we want you to say. And I go, oh, I don't know if I want to say that. And so I send it to Michael and Michael says, what do you really want to say? And I said, well, I want to say sorry to my family. So he says, say sorry to your family. Did you feel unfairly treated by the media through that time? Oh, look, I, I was such in this, this world of kind of like, how do I get out of this? Like, I've got out of it all the other time. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I'll say sorry to my team. Follow the formula. Follow the formula. There's a pattern. There's the formula. And, and I think, you know, the work that I've done with boys, we kind of like, we get ourselves in trouble. We go, how much trouble are you in? Can I get out of it? <laughs> You know, and what do I? What can I do to get out of it? And we'll take the least path of resistance to take the least of the punishment, but and then we'll work up to the scale. And oh no, it's really bad. That was the the kind of like the formula. So I knew I had a formula, but what had changed was when only half the team shook my hand. That was the change. Didn't work. And then it didn't work. Yeah, that's right. It didn't work. And when it doesn't work, it kind of there's a shift. So I thought, okay, I'll get, I'll apologise. You know, I walked into the room and I was well supported. I mean, I was well supported, but I felt alone. And in a moment, I was able to look down the camera and I really, and I apologised to my family. And a shame that I didn't ever, ever think about the shame that I brought on to my nieces and nephews when they go to school and they say, oh, your, your uncle's a drunk. He's an idiot. He's an old man. Why is he an old man? Yeah. And, uh, and my father and my mother. And that was the first time I really owned any of that behavior. And then from there, the journey really began. You know, I was told that I had to go see these people, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the drug and alcohol, all these people. There was still the sense of it was purely a transactional relationship. I had the meeting, spend an hour, I talked to somebody, zipped my card, paid $150 or a couple hundred bucks, whatever it was. And then I met one, one lady in Tawa who actually I felt really listened to me. And after a half a dozen conversations, I realised it was all about me. And that it wasn't about somebody else. I was blaming John Hart for not picking me. I was blaming the coaches. I was blaming my father. It was all about me. And then I got a phone call from one of my good friends, George Orman and Mahi, Bill Hokamo, went to Chiyoti together. They went rugby players. And I went on a journey from Wellington to pick my friend up from or took you to go to a Waipukaro to drive up to Mahia and then go to a place called Portuki. And I met Hidawini James. And he was the first person that gave me a sense of the hole that was inside me of, you know, who I truly was. It wasn't about the trap boy, it was about not having a space, it was an empty space inside me. Like my soul wasn't. And he started the journey on identifying who I was through my whakapā. Went back to a marae up in Tauranga called Hūria. 
sat in a one and for six or seven hours, and there was this over, overwhelming realization that it was me, that he was speaking truth. And these were the words I always remembered most. He said, normally you're either, he said, normally you're either tika or teka. Māori for you're either true or you're full of shit. You get to decide that. Nobody else. You do. And I'm thinking to myself, I really get to decide that? Are you serious? I can decide if I'm true or full of shit. Man, I've been full of shit for a long time. I don't want to be full of shit anymore. And he said, go home and tidy your backyard up. Get rid of all those things that, that you are pretending to be full of shit about. And he wasn't just talking about my physical home. He was talking about my physical house. He was talking about my physical body. I got it. In that instance, I got it. Somebody was finally touched my soul and went, you have a choice. And so I started that journey. And, you know, I stopped drinking. He said, you've got to get down on your knees and pray. I said, I've never prayed before. And he said, try it. Pray for the help that you do not have all the tools, but the tools will come because now you're opening up your heart. Your true existence will come forward. The beginning of your journey starts with humility, not arrogance. What an Start incredible guest he was. Oh, and, and that's what it was. It was like there were moments all the way through that have joined those pieces together. And those were true blessings. But I had to be open to it. I was closed because I am in prison. And I hadn't even described that prison yet. I, I was empty, had an empty soul. I started filling that up just a little bit at a time, enough to keep me on track, enough to, to understand that I had the power to be, to be true or full of shit every day. I wanted to be true. I, you know, I remember driving down the road and people would drive up to me and point at me. I had my first anxiety attack. And that anxiety was, it was like the whole world closed in like this and all I could see was in front of me and, that, and, and my voice in my head kept saying, just look ahead. You can't change what is behind you, but you can be present now. What, what was the fear? What was the fear that was giving judgment. you the panic attack? Yeah. Judgment. I mean, the, the greatest fear is judgment. You know, I remember pulling up into a petrol station in uh, Johnsonville. Nathan, and then the servant came out and said, serve you all kindly. Just after I'd been on the news and was talking, you know, every front page of the paper, I, don't, I, I was going, what have I done really bad? Brutal. You know? What have I done? I became the laughing stock of everybody. I mean, the rugby union management would say, oh, look, we're going to this bar, but Norm can't come. You know, because we're tempting him. I didn't realize it had such an impact. Everybody was kind of tiptoeing around you, trying to Everyone, keep it instead together. Instead of going, yes, instead of going, Norm. And that's where Hiddle and George and Bill and there's a oh, lot of nice people. What was the, you know, that, that, well, those were great gifts. What was truly humble was the thousands of letters I got. I still have those letters. I replied to most of them. But to read those letters um, was the most humbling. But my true angel was, who is now my wife, was the one who really gave me that last piece, that last piece at that beginning of the journey. Because I remember when Queenstown happened, the next day I'm back in Wellington. I called her up and I said, I'm in a whole lot of trouble. And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, think of an Arctic truck full of shit and it's hit the fan. I think, how big's that fan? Well, it's the biggest fan in the world because 
and everyone around me is going to get covered in shit. That's the description I use. Is this the I same girl that you'd been on the few dates with? Few dates. Telling her that my life was great, but it was absolutely chaos, you know. So she's really been with you since the the darkest time. Since ninety nine, absolutely. And you know, in the times that I would pray and come home on the journey, but it was two days after that, after Queenstown, that I called her up and said, "You know, can you come out?" I said, "Look, it's going to get really hard from here." And I'm just not worth it. You need to get out now before you get pulled in. And I'll never forget these words. She looked at me, this is this real intent, and she said, I see something in you. I believe in you. And that was the true hope. And it was to have somebody really look at you. They're not they look through, they look to that the soul, the soul. Behind the eyes, they see something. And she said, I believe in you. I see something in you. And I came back and made her a promise. I said, I will never, ever behave like that ever again. Ever. And so she was my angel. And still is my angel. I still get that wrong every now and then because I'm human. You know, but I realised that now. So 1999 was the catalyst. Are you able, do you see 99 as a gift now, or do you still look back on it and oh, cringe look, a little bit? No, absolute gift. Yeah. Absolute gift. You know, again, it's part of that space of freedom. You know, two years ago was the beginning where I freed myself that from prison. 2015 was, the, was a place to be freed from prison. And that was an amazing Part. 99 was the beginning of the journey to get to 2015 to free that nine year old from prison. It was a 16 you know, year journey from there. 16 year journey. And I, so I tell people, I share with people, don't be in a hurry. You have to consciously get to those parts yourself. But remember the people who are giving you gifts along the way. And you may not realize the gift you'll be given today is something you need two or three or ten years from now. But they're all gifts. If you have an open heart and an open mind, because it is through the hearts and minds we change the world. But you have to have an open heart and open mind. Because it is the heart first before the head. And that's what young people taught me as part of this journey when I started working in the field with young people. They said, talk to my heart, not to my head. They said, protect me when I'm vulnerable and give me something that is real. I realize storytelling and the gifts that I've been given are the blessings of today. And being in this space to be conscious and present. And to be conscious is to know your purpose. And now I realize that I, my journey is one of gathering tools through all walks of being, through the adversity of looking at an 11 year old thinking, what is 11 year old sitting on the loop trying to cut his wrist because that was a space that I know. Or a nine year old to be put in prison at nine because of the violation of violence. Or a boy at 13 to be sexually abused to have to go through promiscuity as, and the sexual journey as promiscuity and to try and become more around just being physical to going on the journey to be an all black and then come to a place to realize that I never want I wanted always to be an all black but I didn't like who I'd become to be told in a moment that I had the power to choose and then somebody says I believe in you and then realize that I've been gifted all these things and people around me that I now live in the presence of all this greatness and the greatness of all these people who have gifted me these tools and these gifts. And that I can repay that by paying it forward of, on multitudes. And that a conversation, or for me, the true essence was always the cup of tea. And my grandmother would say, Norm, 
If she played boy, she played a little shit, man. Put the jug on, let's have a cup of tea, and then she had partner's wisdom. To have great mentors who have always come forward and watched them, and they watch me, and they've guided me into the places that I need to be. To know now that my role is to help people, because I know what it feels like to be free. And that was to go back to my father and ask him when I was in why, Dad, why, when I'm nine years old, why did you beat me to the point where I thought I was going to die? That so, was to so take me through that journey with your dad, just a little bit of context, like through your all black journey and through 99, how's the relationship with him? Because you said when you're 16, you, it was pretty troubled. Where did it go from there? It was, look, we had a, a very combative relationship. You know, we butted heads all the time. There were moments where we could have a beer together, and, you know, but there was, there was never any real conversation. My father came on tour with us in 1993 to the UK. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see him a lot. It wasn't until... Um, my mum and dad owned the One Stead Tavern. It was a country pub up in Central Hawks Bay. I was part of ownership in that pub with my parents. It was a professional era. Um, and we just bought this 11 acres down in Wellington. And I said to mum and dad, look, I'm going to sell the pub. I want you to move down. And that was subconsciously saying, I want to start a journey with my father. What, what year is this? 2001, 2002. So mum packed the bag and said, I'm going. Dad had to follow. But I didn't have the tools necessary to ask my father. And I beat myself up all the time. Like, oh, I'm going to have a cup of tea with Dad. We've got a few things done, but we'd always kind of like, he'd say, let's do it this way. And I'd go, no, nah, look, let's do it this way. And we end up like this. And then we'd, you know, we'd, we'd go and have dinners and everything was going well. Kids came along, you know, he's a grandfather, he's got more grandchildren around. And then I started getting frustrated. Why isn't my dad come to talk to me? Well, our conversations were quite 2011 when I took him to the World Cup final. You know, we went on this road trip. But it was empty. We didn't talk about anything. Or did we talk about everything? But it was empty for me, you know? um, What was missing for you? Love. You know? I was trying, I continued to try and prove to my father that I had changed and I'm a good man, and, but there was no love in that. There was no sense of love. There was no words of love. There was no, it was emptiness. Whether it was there or not, I just, I didn't feel it. And I think that's what I was yearning for, but I didn't know how to start a conversation. Either, because I was still that nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. So... You had to change the whole dynamic of the relationship I first. Did. I did. And it felt like at some point that I was, you know, I'd become the father. And actually, in some points, I was the father since I was a boy. Because I was intervening in, in various points of life to stop those violations happening at home. I would step in. From that moment that I hit my father, I believe I became part of the father figure in their home. So I never ever had the opportunity to be a boy. And yet the boy was still trapped in me. So, you know, years go by. More frustrated. I think it's got to change. My, my son and daughter have arrived into this world. Um, there is no manual to tell you what it's how to be dead. Um, it's tough. It's it's exciting. It's it's adventurous. And, you know, I remember one day I was uh, I was speaking. It was Easter, and I was talking about forgiveness. Oh. I take a step back. I mean, 2005, I was asked to be on the show Dancing with the Stars. You know, and I remember we were having this family dinner, and my dad stands up and he says, This is 2005. He goes, 
Sun always knew you were going to be in orbit, and I was really proud of you to be in orbit. I was thinking because we'd just finished filming a Sunday program in preparation for the final. The current affairs. So, and then my dad goes, and I'm, I'm, I didn't ever think you'd ever be a dancer. But I'm actually more proud of you being coming a dancer than I was when you were in Auckland because it was totally, you know, again, polar opposites. It was this all black and a dancer. This, you know, reputation of this badass, and then he's a dancing in sequence and chiffon. And then you win it. And he said, I'm really sorry for the life I gave you as a boy. You know, and I said, walked up to my dad and I'm I'm crying and I said, Dad, that's all I've ever wanted to hear. And I thought that was the moment in 2005 where, okay, yep, it's good. Two years, three years later, four or five years later, I'm giving this talk about forgiveness. The church. And uh, I stand there and I have this, this moment where I go, I am giving you a talk on forgiveness, and I have just realized that I've never forgiven my father, truly. Father, please forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And I'm a father standing in front of all these people, and I said, I have not forgiven my father. Truly, I mean, this is the depth of forgiveness. And I realized that I have to go and Finally, start a conversation with my father. So we have a family dinner. My son gets up and goes, oh, Dad would like to say something. I said, Dad, I was giving a speech today about forgiveness. And I realized I knew I hadn't forgiven you. There's a little piece that's left that I need your help to guide me through that. So I can truly find that last piece of forgiveness. And I'll ask you to ponder this. And please invite me in for a cup of tea so we can then work through that. So can you think about that? Month goes by. Two months goes by. Eight months goes by and I'm going, they're going to invite me in for this damn cup of tea. (laughs) It's a long thinking. It's a long thinking. A year goes by, two years goes by, and start changing. You know, find dad's getting grumpy. You go down for dinners and sitting on his own. It kind of come, comes up really quick, but I realized my dad is deaf. Starts growling the kids, and you know, there's just slowly comes on. I've always knew he had a hard of hearing, but and I realized that. Actually, it's part of my father's, he's aging, he's going deaf. His TV's up loud, he doesn't find a conversation, he's starting to become a request. He's had a bad experience going to get hearing aids, and so he puts it off for another couple of years, and then, you know, a gift was given to me by a friend who owns a hearing company. I organised my mum and dad hearing aids, and it was a critical point in the in the journey because I saw my mum and dad fall in love again, and the communication come back into the family, and I realised that my dad didn't have the tools. Number one, the hearing aids, but he didn't have the tools or the articulation or the words or or the understanding of what it means to come and have this conversation with his son because he never had it from his son. So I realised I'm the one that has to walk across the bridge. I've been waiting for my father for two, three years to walk across and say, son, can we have a conversation about that that question you, you posed to me to ponder around forgiveness and helping me. And, and as that's happening, my son and I start watching this TV program called The Arrow. 
American sitcom. There's a bad guy on there who's got an eye patch. His name is Slade. His name is Manu Bennett. Manu Bennett was the boy that came to Chiyoti College and I beat him to the point where I felt I was just going to kill him. So that's happening with my father. My son loves this program for the arrow. I've watched Manu grow throughout his Hollywood career and his TV career. And uh, one day we were watching there and I said, oh, I know that guy, son. And he goes, are you dead? How do you know that guy? I said, oh, we went to school together. Did you, Dad? Yeah. yeah. And I gave him a hiding at school. And my son says, oh, how does that make you feel, Dad? And I went, I don't know. This is a nine-year-old. So, oh, that would really stink, son. And he goes, what would you ever do if you ever met him again, Dad? Hmm? Not a big question. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you could say sorry, Dad. Oh, yeah, maybe. I didn't see money for 20 years. Two weeks later, we're walking into the airport and his money sitting in the chair. Amazing. Again, it's part of those gifts. It's the next step of the journey presented. Presented. There it is. And it was just by chance. Well, I think it's the universe, and I believe this. Absolute universe puts things in, in, in motion when you're ready. When you're ready. You have to be ready for the universe to work this way. Like Queenstown, I was ready. Actually, I was forced to be ready, but I was ready. Like my partner, like my friends, like all these people who gifted those gifts. We're in Queenstown on a family holiday. Our plane gets diverted to Auckland, not to Wellington. Oh, yeah. oh it's a bit of a oh, Well, we can go to the Koi Lounge and have some food. And, and here's money then. I walk in and I go, holy shit, that's money. Don't, you know, don't flinch, just kind of like that. You won't see me, but my family, we walk past. Family go up and sit down, and I'm sitting there with my water and looking at my family, looking over at money again. So there's a reason that you're here right now. Here's your moment. What are you going to do, boy? You can look over there and go, yeah, no. Nah. Yeah, no. Nah. No, I'm not going to do that. Or is it time to step into that space? So I look at my family and I realize that the journey was at another stage. And it was to go back to revisit the place of great trauma and own that space of great trauma and apologize with the intent that it required as a man because I was a boy when that trauma happened. So I walked over, said, oh, I'm just going there. Walked over, put my hand on Money's shoulder, and I said, Money. And seen him for 20 years, and he turned around and went, Man, it's really good to see you, bro. We hung, we hugged, we sat down, and we had a conversation. He was heading to Wellington to do the last part for The Hobbit. It was the White Orc. You know, I don't know, but the White Orc. And as we were talking, I said, Money, I, I really want to say how much I am sorry for that moment at school. I'm really sorry for that moment. That opened up another space. The next day, we brought our families together and we're sitting at Tapapa, who's Wellington. And I said, I never realized this, Money, but we come from the same tribe. We fuck a puppet together. We're actually kindred. We're farming. And there's too much of families hurting families, brothers hurting brothers, fighting over things that we do not know why. I would really like us to go on a journey. I think it would be a powerful journey. 
And was that moment at school where you beat him up, was that a, a, a memory that had stuck with him? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was one of the most traumatic moments. But it actually was on top of more. The, it was the most traumatic moment at school, but not in his life, because he'd been sent to Teoto because his mother had just been killed in the car crash, car crashes in Australia. A month after his mother passed away, his brother had been in a coma for like 10 years. It was 10 years previous, his brother was uh, put in a coma in a car crash. So his mother passes. His brother passes a month later. He gets sent to Teoto College. And I don't know any of this, and I don't care. And I beat him to a point where he feels he's going to go. And then he leaves because he doesn't want to come back. I carry on and we go on my journey. We go like this. And here we are in the moment. And we start the journey of uh, the documentary, Making Good Men. And all along, the father, my father, is still over here. And he's, he's in the background. And I realize as we're going through that journey with Making Good Men, it actually takes me all the way back to my father again. And when I say to my father, Dad, I'm going to make this documentary. I'm Dad making this documentary. And throughout this time, like, it's my son's ninth year of life. And there's a significance about that because it was the moment that I was in prison. And I keep going back and revisiting this again. My son is nine and he hasn't had the trauma that I've had, but he's had other trauma. What is the trauma that I have control of? What are, you know, I'm asking myself all these questions around myself. So a friend of mine, Fiona Apanui, who's who I trust implicitly around doing his rights to Amakura Productions, we went on a journey to make this documentary. But ultimately it takes me all, all the way back to my farm. So I'm sitting with my mum and dad before we even began, and I'm saying, look, I'm going to make this documentary. Out of, out of respect, I really would like you to be part of it. And my father just goes nuts. How do you, you selfish man? How do you, you know, bring this back into the light? I thought we'd dealt with it and put it away, and I didn't realise that for my father, it was like he'd be compartmentalised it, put it in a shoebox, stuck it in the cupboard, locked that cupboard, put another cupboard around that, and put it away in the darkness. And they got really angry, and I said, look, my intent is not to be angry. This is going to be a great documentary. And you are a part of that. Not going to be a part of it, no one's going to buy it. And I thought, well, okay, that's it. So we start making this documentary. What I realise is that I have to help my father get to that point. So I go down and I start sharing with him. I said, Dad, uh, I want to know what I'm going to say when you pass. What am I going to stand up and say? What am I going to talk about? Because all I have is, is memories that I don't want to share. How do I talk about a father who was nothing more than a violent man? I would rather talk about a man who has this legacy that the journey of breaking cycles of violence and owning that space for a generation. How a man broke the silence for that generation to heal. I really would like you to think about that because I would really would like you to be part of this documentary. I want you to ponder this. A few weeks later, we're, we're going to watch my boy play rugby and dad's in the car and I say, you know, today we're going to do some filming. And he said, oh, just lucky. Oh, the other day I was listening to the national radio and there was a story of this girl talking about how much hurt her father put upon her and, and she had come to this place to forgive him. And it, 
thinking about our cup of teas and our conversations. And he goes, I know what you want. I know, I know, I get it. I want to be part of it. And from that point, I realised that, again, it was another part of the journey. I wanted to go back to revisit my father. And I remember having this conversation. I get down with my son. My mum is there. And I said, Dad, I've now found a place where I, I feel I can ask you this question. As part of this journey with this documentary is, is to now open up a whole lot of things that I need to know as a, as a man that I can walk through and deal with. I'm nine years old when you take the belt off and you give me a hiding and I feel like I'm going to die. I've always wanted to know why. Why were you so jealous? Why were you so angry all the time? And my son was sitting on my right hand, my mum sitting between myself and my father, and my father looks at me and goes, son, it never happened. And I remember my mum putting a hand on my father's knee, or her hand on my father's knee. He said, Dad, you beat this boy all the time. More than any of our other kids, you beat this boy more than any of them. And then my father started to cry. I've never seen my father cry like this before. It went right to his soul. The wailing of my father. And then I start to cry and I look at my son and he goes, Dad, are you okay? And I said, son, this is a good thing. My father stands and I see this frail old man. So I stand and walk. And as he hugs me, he says, son, I don't know why I was so angry, but I'm really sorry. And it was the first time I heard his soul speak to me. And I was that nine-year-old boy again. And then he said this, for all my life, I've always wanted these words. He said, son, I love you. And then he set me free. 46, 47 years old, when my father sets me free in that moment. And that is the moment I realized I was trapped in prison and can describe what prison feels like looking back and there. And I know what it feels like to be set free, to go back to the place of trauma, to go back to the person who traumatized that space. It was one of the most amazing gifts and moments of my entire life. You still remember it, word oh, for word? Is, absolutely. How and challenging was document. it to ask that question in that moment? Well, I think the whole thing, the whole thing has been a journey. Has been a journey of preparation for that moment. So it actually wasn't hard. You I just ready. knew it was right. Yes, absolutely. And the preparation of everybody into that space allowed that to happen. And because I was conscious about it, I knew exactly what that moment meant. What it has enabled is a wider conversation. 2015 was the year of healing, forgiveness, humility, and peace. 2016 was the discovery of purpose. In 2017 is to be epic in that purpose. And what do you say that your purpose is now? My purpose is to help people go back to that space and help them set them free. Whether it is a family, a community, is to acknowledge that trauma comes from a generational line. And we can set those, those spaces free is to actually help people find a purpose. And I find it absolutely 
humbling in the work that I'm involved in, whether it's work with corporates or businesses or teams or communities or schools, the purpose is just that, to actually take people on a journey. And as people find us, the smallest things that have trapped them or the barriers are the smallest things. And to actually practice those principles as best as I possibly can. That's my purpose. And how do you feel? You know, it's obviously that's the purpose New Zealand needs right now. As someone like you, when you see like the youth suicide rate is at its highest level ever, domestic violence keeps getting worse and worse. You've been through all of it. Um, so, what do you think New Zealand needs right now that it's not getting? So I've come come to the point, Nathan, where it's, it's about humanity first, not about religion. It's not about culture. It's actually about humanity and care. When do we stop caring? And the care is to go to somebody and say, I can see you. I acknowledge your pain, but you don't have to be trapped there anymore. Humanity realizing that it's not the culture or the, the religion, it is about people. What is the most important thing in the world? If we pay heed to the words that were given from our ancestors, then we are greater than as one than we are before. If we truly believe that that's what we want, we can create that any time because it's a conscious decision. So consciousness is one. And humanity is not to be judged by your colour, your creed or your belief, is to judge you as a human being. But who is the one to judge you? If all you need is what I see for us men is to say this three times, are you okay? No, no, no. Are you okay? Are you okay? And each time with the pause is to allow that man, and that's a man, who to drop down to that next level of understanding that this person in front of you really cares. And then it's the, the fourth part of that is the question to say, can I help you? Can I do anything for you? What do you need me to do? In the same question, we don't stop long enough to be seen. We so want to be we're kind of in our own worlds, just doing our own thing, looking after ourselves well, and not caring. It's the mask. We pretend to be this person outwardly, but in there, there's this. There's a human being sitting there, going, "Why am I? Why is my existence here in this world?" What is my purpose? We've lost purpose. Purpose to do what? To play a game of sport? Purpose to do what? To be a better human being? But if I look at all my role models, what are they telling me? Well, you can steal and you can be deceitful, you can be promiscuous, you can do whatever. What is my role models telling me? Well, there's three, can... three things, like three really interesting things you've said you know as you've been talking and the first one is having your wife your girlfriend at the time look you in the eye and say i believe in you and how important that is to have someone in your life that believes in you or to be that person for someone and it's only a couple of little words but you know you, you haven't forgot that moment in all this time um and then the second thing you know similar to that but having that mentor that believes in you, like you said, sees something in you even when you can't see it. And the third thing that I found interesting was that, you know, finding your culture, find your heritage and understanding your Māori culture and how important a role that played, having someone show you your heritage. Because if we look at, you know, suicide statistics or anything, it is disproportionate among Māori and Pacific Islanders. Yet that part of your heritage is what helped you find yourself. And to understand that is to come back to the basic need of somebody cares and believes. 
Lovely. We're, we're misunderstanding the word love. The true misunderstanding of love is comes not from a physical sense, but a true knowing that look, we're, we're human beings, we're going to make mistakes. Mistakes in our lives, you know, my greatest strength as a leader is my vulnerability, which makes me human. But now I will apologize first because I'm going to get it wrong. We set people up to fail in the world because we tell them that the world is going to take care of them. The world is a hard place. There's this sense of everything's going to be okay. It can be if we have this real sense of belief and care. And love. I mean, Aroha is the, is, the, is the first poem, what I believe. If I gift love, I receive love. But if I gift terror, I receive terror. I consciously can de determine the outcome of my family's day by how I walk in the room that night. I consciously can decide what I say and what I do. We, we're subconsciously putting that into someone else's hands, all consciously doing that, by saying the system will take care of it. What is the system? And those are the big questions for me. What does New Zealand mean? Well, to me, we need to stand, stand and start having the conversation that we never had as our as a child. Are you okay? Do you know what happened to you? And this is the thing that I, that young people taught me 10 years working with the SBCA. When I was talking about, when I talk about my childhood, I can see the children who are living in these worlds because they shine like a beacon. And so many of them have come up in my presence and just stood there. And without any words, you know what they're crying out for is somebody to see them and then tell them it wasn't their fault. You recognize and that they, look on their face? Recognize it. But I just don't see it in kids. I see it in adults. Mm -hmm. All the time. When we look behind the veil, it's a very thin but you look past that, you see the person. And when you can talk to that person, then you can have a conversation. That's what we need. Real authentic, warm, caring, loving conversations. I think we have a deprivation of spirit, and that's why we're in this, there's, there's a lot of people in this world of darkness. And that deprivation. Well, there's a moment, there's, um, there's a, a my friend Sophia Eastman, she wanted me to ask you, you know, like, and you've 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 mentioned it, like this is a generational thing that will just keep going on and on and on, and so, I mean, you've kind of given us the full story, but she wanted to know when was that moment you decided that it ended with your generation, that your kids weren't going to go through what you went through. I started that conversation with myself when I was young, um, like I made a promise that I would never would be my father. I never hurt, want to hurt my family. Um, but I realised it wasn't the physical hurt that I was giving my family. It was all the other hurt that I was giving with neglect and with words and with the lot. And it wasn't until I was set free that I realised I had the true power to change a generation. And I still get it wrong. And I apologize more than I've ever, ever done. I have conversations with my son and my daughter and say, please help me be a better father. Because I don't have, don't know what you want. I mean, my father's, when my son said to me, Dad, can you stop calling me names? Simple. I said, I can control that. I can control them. And every now and then I go, I'm getting, I'm getting better, Amy. You are getting better, Dad. I'm conscious of it. 
it takes some vulnerability nice. on your part and dropping that's the, the car. That's the gift. That's the gift, isn't it? Mm. Is to actually be vulnerable. You know? My daughter said, Can you stop looking at me that way, Dad? It's the look. I said, Oh, I don't know. I'm always going to have part of that in me, daughter, because I'm going to say, You've grown up too fast. But I can consciously do that. Yeah, you're aware of it. I'm aware of it. It's the, you know, that self awareness of, but it's the question. Son, I didn't realize I hurt you when I did that. But I do realize that now, and I'm really sorry. I'll try my best to never do it again, but I apologize again because I know I'm going to get it wrong. Please continue to help me be a better dad. Love it. You know, that's when I realize. And we've only got a couple of minutes left, Norman. The, the last question this has been, um, I'm so grateful to you for opening up, like, again, to take someone like you, to share your story, to own the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, and it's a, it's a real privilege to have this conversation. Um, the question I ask everybody, and everybody loves this question, and I'm, I'm curious for you, is about the dark side, you know, and it's something that men don't like to talk about. We've all got it, but we don't like to talk about it. And I think you're pretty qualified to talk about it. But is there a dark side in you, even through all this work and everything you've gone through and everything you've shared, is there a dark side you still have to be aware of? Oh, consciously, yeah. Um, just to, I, I, I describe it like this. When I let the shadow into the space, all darkness consumed it. But when light came into that space, the darkness was at bay. So the darkness is always present, but it's up to me to continue to shine the light. And I have the ability to do that every day. And every day that I practice bringing the light into the dark, the shadows that are there, the less that I have to do to look at that darkness. And so it's practicing the principle of bringing the light. And what is that? It's consciousness. It's awareness. It's the power of language. It's the power of being. It's being present. Knowing that people just want a bit of you. So it's ever present. And I always say that nobody will ever be free of that darkness. But be aware it's always there. It's just how much you choose to shine the light on it. How much you choose. And that's where, you know, I've come to that point, like consciousness. You consciously choose the dark and you consciously choose the light. I can, I can testify to you this. The more I've brought the light into my life, the better and greater my life has been because it's enabled me to be present and conscious to the people I'm in life. If people can start practicing that, that's the simple tool. Be great in that space, because the light will always shine, whether you're present or you're not. Beautiful. It's a great message to go out on. Kia ora, Norm. And just to bring it full circle, the first thing you said is as a little boy, you know, the world was a big adventure. And I hope you, you know, I can see it in your face. You, That's how you see the world again now. You know, that little Absolutely. boy that's just out there to make a difference and be on purpose and see it as an adventure again. Well, I'm truly back to the space of being who I always was. And that was that little boy. Yeah. And to be that is to be true. It's the greatest gift. It is the greatest gift. Thank you, man. Thanks, Norm. Thanks for coming on. Very well. Very well. Well, there you have it, folks. My conversation with the inspiring, insightful, and uh, just beautiful human, Norm Hewitt. I hope you enjoyed that uh, episode. Give it a like uh, on Facebook. Share the episode around. Tell your friends. Uh, this is uh, such a, an important topic that Norm and I are talking about, and it's very, very important for New Zealand. So if you care about New Zealand and you care about making a difference, share this episode around and uh, on social media or just tell your friends about it. And I will love you guys forever. Thanks for everything. I'll see you next week for episode 29 of The Nathan Seward Show.
That was The Nathan Seawood Show. Personal conversations with powerful men.